This afternoon, we're happy to have Rutger Bregman uh, on Navarro Media. He's the author of Utopia for Realists, originally published in Dutch in 2014. It is now available in paperback in English. Rutger, welcome. It's great to be here. The first question I really want to ask comes right at the start of the book. You say that the most profound crisis we presently face is one of imagination. Now, on the one hand, I'm inclined to agree, mm -hmm. but on the other, with climate change, aging, automation, these are all very much material limits on our species, on potentially market capitalism. Mm -hmm. Do you really think that a crisis of imagination is the biggest impediment to human progress right now? Or in other words, if we could just have new ideas, new processes, new techniques, we can overcome pretty much any problem that's put in front of us. Well, my frustration when I started writing this book a couple of years ago was that I saw so many people who called themselves progressives or, you know, people on the left who knew very well what they were against, against a lot of things, you know, racism, austerity, homophobia, growth, climate change, you name it, uh, but didn't really have a clear idea of what they were actually for, right? Um, so that's why I started writing the book, is that if you want to do about anything about, you know, the big challenges of, of today, and climate change definitely is the main one here, um, I think you need to talk in the language of hope and talk in the language of progress. Now, in that sense, the book may already be a little bit dated because now, for example, in the US, you have politicians like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez talking about the Green New Deal, which is exactly what I've been hoping for, for for the past couple of years, is that those kind of politicians uh, would rise. Uh, not just people who are talking about, you know, in the past in which supposedly everything was better, but also have a bold vision for the future. I understand the impulse to want to provide hope, because obviously these can be often quite bleak times, but do you think that has the potential to downplay the scope and scale of something like climate change? So even if we did have a successful Green New Deal in North America and Europe, and we decarbonize the next 15, 20 years, we could still see global warming of two degrees, which is called a low warming scenario. But that could still mean hundreds of millions of climate refugees, couldn't it? You're absolutely right. I'd like to make a distinction here between optimism and hope, right? So the optimist says, you know what, everything will be all right. Uh, the, the, we've seen so much progress in the past 30 years. We're richer, we're healthier, we're wealthier than ever. And indeed, that's true. If you look at many statistics from the past couple of decades, there's a lot to be grateful for. Um, but then the optimist often, often assumes that history is this kind of roller coaster, that these things ha happen automatically. But no, these often, like the, the main changes in the past two centuries, like the people fought for that very hard. And often they were first dismissed as unreasonable and radicals, right? Um, the people who first fought for, you know, uh, the end of slavery or democracy or equal rights for men and women, you know, it often starts on the fringes with, with these radical, so-called crazy people. Um, and what they often have is, is not optimism, but they have hope. And sometimes hope can be false, right? Sometimes it turns out, you know, that doesn't work out the way you want. But you need it because then you can start imagining a different world and then you can make it into a self-fulfilling prophecy. So one of the more hopeful proposals you have, originally the book in Dutch was called Free Money for All, Free yes. Money for Everyone, hmm. is a universal basic income, which it's fair to say has become pretty mainstream yeah. um, over the intervening years. It's almost years. not a utopian idea anymore. I mean, yeah. five years ago when I first wrote about it, almost no one knew what it was, right? I really had to explain that when I was giving lectures about it. It's just an amazing example of how these ideas often start on the fringes and then they start moving towards the center and now it's always being discussed as a mainstream idea. You talk about how it's a policy proposal which could broach differences between the left and the right. Mm -hmm. And it's a very careful analysis of, of it in that regard. But do you not think that for the left, a UBI, universal basic income, is very much a complement to traditional welfare state, or what's now being called universal basic services, yeah. whereas for the right, it's viewed more as a replacement for them. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that something that you're worried about, or do you think, because in the book, it seems you're quite hopeful mm -hmm. about this being the kind of policy which can sort of broach mm -hmm. partisan divides. Well, a couple of ideas here. Um, in the first place, you're absolutely right that there are versions of universal basic income out there that would be horrible, right? So there are some libertarians out there, for example, in the US who would say, let's just abolish the whole welfare state and just supplant it with one small cash grant. That'd be horrible, right? No doubt about that. 
I really think that a basic income should be a supplement to the great achievements of, of say, the post-war world, right? A supplement to universal health care, to good quality public education. In that sense, it should be the crowning achievement of socio-democracy. Um, I think that's really, really important to keep in mind. Still, it is also true that some of the criticisms of the welfare state that usually come from conservatives from the right about the welfare state being so bureaucratic, so paternalistic, you know, that so often people on the left have this assumption that they know what's best for the poor, right? That they can help the poor make better decisions in their lives. And I, to be honest, I think that criticism is valid, is valid. And that, that the real experts on the poor's lives are the poor themselves. And that it's true that there's a lot of evidence that just giving people money is often the best solution to this thing we call poverty. Um, so in that sense, you, you could argue that I make some right-wing points in my book, is that I have a, a lot of faith in individual freedom, especially when, it, when, when I'm talking about the poor. You offer a sort of potted history of the idea of UBI, really since arguably the late 18th century, but it comes really into focus in the mid 20th century. Mm -hmm. Why do you think um, ideas like an eight hour working day or the weekend or welfare state provision, mm -hmm. why do you think they won, but UBI didn't? What was the big difference? Mm -hmm. Because it looked almost inevitable at one point in the mid 60s. Mm -hmm. And yet, like you say, until a few years ago, it was disregarded as entirely implausible. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not the kind of historian that believes in big laws, you know, that history is governed by these, I don't know, uh, laws that you can just see these trends and that should supposedly explain everything. I don't think that. There's a lot of coincidence here. So if you really zoom in on this history, what you find is that at the end of the 60s, almost everyone believed that some form of basic income was going to be implemented in the United States and in Canada and probably other countries would have followed after that. Uh, and then in the early 70s, Richard Nixon almost did it. He had a modest proposal for a basic income, which would have been quite revolutionary because it would have changed the whole thinking around what, what the welfare state can be. Uh, and then you really, if you then really delve into that history, you find out that just last minute, Nixon was convinced to, to, to do something different and to talk in a different language about uh, welfare. He started talking about uh, welfare as workfare, started talking about the lazy poor, and he was convinced that you know, basic income may not work, work out as well. Uh, but it almost happened. There's also the tragic irony, actually, that his bill went through the House of Representatives twice, and then it was killed in the Senate by Democrats who loved the idea of a basic income, uh, but wanted a higher uh, version of it. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, it's full of these kind of coincidences. Just touching on that idea of the economics of universal basic income, one common criticism, and I, I think it's quite a valid one, mm -hmm. is that a effective UBI would be highly expensive and an affordable UBI would be ineffective. So, for instance, mm -hmm. Compass in the UK modelled a UBI of around £280 a month, so it wasn't very generous. Mm -hmm. I think this would have cost in the region of £150 billion, £170 billion a year. Mm -hmm. And the impact they saw on pensioner poverty was like, fell by 5 or 6%. It fell from... 16% to 11%, something like this. And child poverty, I think, more or less stayed static. Mm -hmm. um, what's your response to the idea that a useful UBI mm -hmm. is unaffordable? Well, that's, that's definitely not the kind of basic income that I'm advocating. It, it, it would have to be much more substantial. Um, maybe the best way to think about this is that in the short run, we move forward with implementing something like a guaranteed basic income. So how would that work? What you would actually do is, as soon as people fall below the poverty line, you'd automatically top up their incomes so that you, know, you really build a floor into the economy and no one can fall uh, in poverty. Now, if you then look at some of the models, uh, you'll find that, for example, in the US, they calculated this, a guaranteed basic income that completely eradicates poverty would cost around $350 billion. So that's less than half of the military budget. It's less than 1% of GDP is entirely affordable. Then if you look at the benefits of such a basic income of actually eradicating poverty, what you'll find out is that, for example, the cost of child poverty are calculated at like $500 billion. So it's cheaper to eradicate poverty than to combat the symptoms of it. 
I think this is another example where you can use a different kind of language, almost kind of like a business or a right-wing language to defend progressive ideas, right? If you don't have a heart, you have a wallet. It makes financial sense, uh, these, these ideas. Investing in, in things like eradicating poverty or universal health care for that matter, you get a great return on investment. In theory, I agree with you, but the left has adopted sort of rhetoric like that for about 15, 20 years. And on precisely these outcomes, things have gone backwards. Do you, do you think the problem with that is it's just been advanced by the wrong people or you sort of, you, so you don't see a problem with the left defending certain policies on a sort of return on investment basis? Mm -hmm. When we talk about the poor, we often use the language of care mm -hmm. and of things being unjust, right? And we want to help these people. And sure, there's a certain part of the population that is receptive to that kind of language. Maybe 10, maybe 20, maybe 30%. Yeah. But you're not going to win elections with that. So this is often what I think people on the right are better at, or conservatives are better at. They use sort of a broader span of uh, you know, moral frameworks or language that appeals to more people. Uh, and uh, in that sense, yeah, people on the left could do a much better job. But in the US, I think it's a percentage of GDP, twice as much is spent on healthcare, yet 40 million people mm -hmm. aren't covered. I mean, that language doesn't seem to have prevailed there. I mean, if Well, you... why is a politician like AOC so effective right now? But I think because she talks years. in the language of hope, yeah. of optimism, of like, we can actually do this. She right. taps into American history, talks about a Green New Deal. Yeah. Uh, she shows that actually... In the 50s, in the 60s, the US had much higher top marginal tax rates for the very rich. That's sort of the, the, the things you can try and do instead of just only talking about things being unjust and you're against this and you're against that. Um, I, I'm not saying you shouldn't be against all those things, but you got to think carefully how you can actually appeal to a much broader group of people. And so you'd see this as a sort of failing of the center-left in the early 2000s? Yeah, it's what I call underdog socialism. Right, so but that's not Blair. I mean, sorry to interrupt you, but that's not the experience in Britain is, of course, the Tony Blair years. That's not Tony Blair, and yet social attitudes, for instance, against um, well, I people on benefits went backwards. I, w I wouldn't call Tony Blair as being anywhere on the left. I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. Margaret Thatcher was once asked what she considered her big, biggest victory. I think she, she, that was at the end of the nineties, and she answered, "Well, my biggest victory was Tony Blair and New Labour," which is, I think. A great example of how political change often works, right? We we often so really focus on politicians in the present. Well, if you zoom out a little bit, what really matters are the ideas that are pushing the political debate. Technocrats of the heart. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like I like that idea. No, I mean I, I generally agree with you, but the experience here, perhaps perhaps it's just the wrong people peddling that kind of language. Um, GDP. It's another big idea. Um, how limited is it in terms of measuring um, the success of a society? Well, again, if you go back to the history of the concept of, of a gross domestic product, it's quite fascinating to find out that the guy who invented it, Simon Kuznets, uh, American economist, what he actually said is that we should never, ever use it as a measure of progress. You know, it was really invented to do something about the recession in the 1930s, and to help the, the American economy prepare for the war, it was very useful for that as well, uh, but not as a measure of progress. Uh, so what Kuznet said is, if you still want to use it in that way, then at least, at least subtract all spending on the military, on advertising, and the whole financial sector, because they don't contribute much to the general welfare of the people. That's the guy who invented it, mm -hmm. right? Since then, what we've seen happening is that, yeah, GDP really has become this holy grail that it started to dominate the whole political debate and journalists and politicians all focus on, oh, it's a percentage point up, it's down, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, careers are being made and, 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 and broken by it. it yeah, it's, it's become this bizarre ideology, basically. So if you read The Economist, you see at the back page, there's always the GDP stats, quarterly, annual for every yeah. major. And it's like, it's like, weird everyday ideologues because it is a mass publication yeah. go straight to the gdp stats it's almost like looking at the football results yeah yeah and they're so imprecise actually you have these corrections mm. often after a couple of years and they update the gdp statistics and sometimes whole recessions just disappear so for example there are some historians that argue that you know the the, the recession at the end of the 70s i believe that was helpful in bringing margaret thatcher into power 
actually disappeared in the later statistics. So, so there wasn't a recession. Wasn't a recession. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. But that's that's the thing. These these numbers are so influential here. And then the other thing is that GDP assumes that the amount of money or wealth you contribute to a GDP is actually the amount of wealth you contribute to the real world, which is obviously not true at all. You know, just before the financial crash, the financial sector in the UK was huge, like 10, 11 percent of GDP. Was it creating so much wealth then? No, obviously not. It was destroying wealth on a massive scale, never seen before in British history. Um, so that's incredibly misleading uh, to look at those figures and, and, and to pretend that you know something about the health of, of your economy. Do we need bankers? You talk about briefly about, I think bankers going on strike in Ireland in the yeah. 70s, right? In the 70s, yeah. Do we, do we need bankers or should finance be socialized? I mean, how, how important is that sector of the economy to, to running things as we see it in an everyday sort of level? Well, here again, I like the idea of just going back to the 50s, basically. So uh, Trump had this, uh, has this idea, obviously, of make America great again, he wants to go back to the 50s. And yeah, we had top marginal tax rates of like 80, 90 percent in the 50s. We had a financial sector that was much, much smaller. Like back then, bankers were like, I don't know, the sort of the, the, the head of a school, like respected figures, but not, you know, with these uh, huge houses mm. and, and, and multiple cars, etc. Mm. Uh, just much more modest. And the banking sector was really a service sector that helped other in industries do their work, right? So I think uh, that you need bankers, definitely, uh, but you don't need the, all that speculation that's going on right now, all these destructive financial products that don't add anything to the wealth of our society, but just extract it from people who are doing the real work. And if you don't believe me, you can just read, you know, the latest reports from even, uh, you know, organizations like the International Monetary Fund or even the Bank of International Sett Settlements is writing the t same things right now, is that actually what we've seen since the 70s and the 80s is that so many smart people who used to go on and work for, say, universities, for example, now they all go into banking mm -hmm. and they're wasting their lives over there. They're way too smart to, 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 be, to be working for banks. They could, they could be thinking about the cure for cancer or how we get to Mars or all these or, or, or how we deal with climate change, right? So that's really one of the biggest tragedies of our times is that we're wasting so much talent in these bullshit industries. Yeah, I mean, Keynes famously referred to economists or as he would like to see them as being similar to dentists, mm -hmm. sort of a technical yeah. role that's just correcting yeah. sort of imperfections. Yeah. In terms of Britain as well, and where we might call it a misallocation of labor, the best engineers in this country go work for arms manufacturers, BAE systems, yeah. and then the best quantitative people, sort of mathematicians, scientists, yeah. go to work in the city. Yeah. I mean, like you say, it's just... Yeah. But it's remember here that this is... It's, sorry, it's important to remember here that this is not inevitable. Um, it's really caused by these changes we made in the tax code, in you know, the deregulation of the financial sector, for example, is that suddenly all these jobs exist where they can you know, pay these people so much money. It wasn't the case 30, 40 years ago. So yeah, we can move back to an economy where people, especially rich people or people who have all these talents, actually do something useful. There was a poll uh, just a couple of months ago by two Dutch economists where they asked people in, I think one of 20, 30 countries, something like that. They asked them the question, do you think your job adds anything of value to society? Right? Do you contribute to the common good? Turns out that in developed economies, 25% of the workforce says, mm. not sure, probably not. 25%. Just think about it. It's pretty high, right? Think yeah, about I mean, that, right? Amazing. So we've got an employment unemployment rate here. What is it? Five, six percent? Historically. So, so this low, is yeah. this right is low. five times as high, and no one's talking about it. And who are these people? Well, they're certainly not teachers or, or nurses or care workers or whatever. I mean, we're talking about bankers and lawyers and, and consultants, people who went to great universities, to Oxford or Cambridge, you know, and society paid a lot to get them educated. And then they go on to do these jobs. And it's not me just saying, it's people themselves saying they're not contributing anything. And then they have their midlife crisis when they're like 40 years old, and then they start painting the rest of their lives. 
can't we just skip that? Can't people just immediately start doing what they actually want to do and do something useful? Again, this is why I'm enthusiastic about a basic income. Um, because in the first place, it would get, give people the means to actually do something that they care about. But in the second place, it will give much more bargaining power to the nurses and the care workers and the teachers who do the really valuable work. But if they go on strike, we're in trouble, right? So in a basic income society, with a high enough basic income, their wages go up. And the people who do all these bullshit jobs, you know, as the American anthropologist David Graeber calls them, their wages will have to go down. Because if they go on strike, no one cares, right? Go on strike for them. Sure. If you were talking to Labour right now, you're talking to Jeremy mm -hmm. Corbyn, John McDonnell, obviously there could be a general election. There's going to be one, obviously, between now and 2022. It's probably going to be more mm -hmm. likely to be sooner rather than later. And they said, Rutka, we're looking at a full day weekend. We're looking at a small UBI. These are policies which have been outlined recently by the New Economics Foundation. Mm -hmm. We're looking at universal basic services. But we know we can't sort of adopt all three in a Labour Party manifesto. What would your advice be to them? Why can't you adopt all three of them? The costs. I mean, if, if you were to say, uh, if we were to say UBS for trans, so free universal, just to clarify for the mm -hmm. audience, a UBS of public transport, education, healthcare, housing. I mean, that's clearly mm -hmm. hundreds of billions. Clearly, a UBI, we could model 200 billion plus. Mm -hmm. Four day week, I mean, we'll put that to one side because some arguments say the productivity gains make up for the day lost. Mm -hmm. But you, you would just say to them, do all of it. Sure, yeah. And you got to think about the returns of all these investments as well, right? That's what often frustrates me is that we... Even people on the left only talk about the cost. So this is too expensive, that is too expensive. No, the real thing that's really expensive is child poverty or poverty in general. That is expensive. That, we can't afford that in terms of higher healthcare costs, higher crime rates, kids doing less well in school. So yeah, I think that the, especially the Labour Party right now shouldn't be so obsessed with, I don't know, trying to be a moderate or a centrist once again. Right? I think we live in a time right now where the real radical thing, the real crazy thing, is to be a centrist or a moderate and to pretend that just tinkering around the edges will do it. It's not enough. It's, it's clear. I mean, in just 10, 20, 30 years, we need to have this massive transformation mm. of the whole economy. Mm. Right? We need to ultimately to move into some kind of war economy, something that has never been done before in peacetime, if we want to address the, the threat of climate change. Yep. So you can't be a moderate. It's the most irresponsible thing right now to be a moderate. A lot of your proposals, politics, sort of just say 50s, 60s, look at the tax rates, mm -hmm. look at how universal, welfare, oh, look at how universal um, welfare provision was, look at rises in GDP, productivity, wages. Mm -hmm. And that's all inarguable. Mm -hmm. The counter argument to those policies and that reading and um, the tendency which says we can just replicate that in the 21st century is to say, well, actually, the historical conditions which make post-war social democracy possible, and it was incredibly successful, mm -hmm. were a one-off. So you get a massive move of workers from country to city, women entering the labor market, obviously huge extraction of fossil fuels, um, adoption of technologies which have been hanging around really for 50, 60, 70, 80 years um, in places like Italy, Japan, and just mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're becoming incredibly diffuse. That creates massive growth rates, mm -hmm. which can then allow this compact between the state and capital mm -hmm. of both high profits, but also high taxes. Mm -hmm. And the argument is that isn't replicable. So we can't look back to post-war social democracy as a model mm -hmm. in terms of the economies and societies we want to build mm -hmm. in the 2020s, 2030s. What do you think of that counter argument? Well, here's what I think about that. Think about something like the New Deal in the US, right? What made it so effective, obviously, was there, there was a lot of slack in the economy. There were so much people, you know, basically without a job who all, you know, wanted to contribute something and they could use that. But actually, if you look at our current economy, it's pretty much the same thing. Maybe people are not like literally unemployed, but then at least they're in a job that they don't care about. So we have an extraordinary amount of, of slack in the current economy. We could do so much bigger things than we think are possible right now. I think we could easily move in 10, 20 years to a zero carbon economy. We could do that. We are more than rich enough. We got, we got the, the brilliant minds for it. We've got the technologies already. It's just a matter of deploying, deploying, deploying. Um, what's really holding us back here 
is not technology, it's not economics, but it's ideology, right? It's all here. And I think that's the main thing that needs to change. And that's why I you know, started my book with the point that the real crisis we have right now is a crisis of the imagination.